There's definitely things that, that everybody could do. There's, there's untapped potential. Uh, and what we see right now in society is people who are incredibly accomplished, but those are the people who have the combination of genius and determination, and they're very good at managing themselves, or they're very good at figuring out what their weaknesses are. Whereas there's tons of people who are like lying around on their couches all day who have the same cognitive potential. There's just no technology for extracting it. Hello, everyone. You're listening to The Feedback Loop on Singularity Radio, where we keep you up to date on the latest technological trends and how they're impacting the transformation of consciousness and culture from the individual to society at large. This week, our guest is Diana Fleischman, an evolutionary psychologist whose specialties include disgust, sexuality, and hormones. She's also heavily involved in the effective altruism community which feels especially relevant for the Singularity community, given the focus on leveraging tech and business to solve global issues. Now, this episode picks up in the middle of a conversation Diana and I were having about transhumanism before we started recording, and from there it goes through a variety of topics, including social engineering, our relationships with technology and language, effective altruism, and creating Skinner boxes for ourselves, where we create systems that condition us towards better behaviors. I want to give an extra big thanks to Diana for having this conversation with me when she did, as she was just recovering from COVID, and I really appreciate that she made the time in spite of still feeling a bit out of sorts from the experience. As always, before we get into it, I want to remind you all to jump over to su.org slash podcast if you are interested in exploring membership options and ways in which you can become involved in the podcast, from providing questions, suggesting guests, and even potentially being a guest on one of our upcoming community episodes. Episodes. And with that being said, I think that covers everything. So let's go ahead and get into it. Everyone, please welcome to the podcast, Dr. Diana Fleischman. But yeah, I would still consider myself a transhumanist. And and I think that even you could even make the argument that even just living with technology as we are now, we're already there in many ways. Yeah. That's one of the things that actually really attracted me to you. And, you know, some people were curious about why I'm in interviewing and discussing, uh, you know, entrepreneurship and innovation and technology uh, with somebody whose background is in evolutionary psychology. And my yeah. thought is like, listen, I, I don't understand how it could be, how like the, the desire for sex and, uh, status and survival and the the motivators of all our behavior in general aren't somehow tied into why we're creating technology how we behave in the world why we're driving to do these things so i'm curious maybe um to that point you just made what do you see the relationship uh, is between kind of technology and evolutionary psychology and maybe perhaps what's interested you in that dynamic People often say that evolutionary psychologists are interested in maintaining the status quo, that we have some attachment to even like a 1950s nuclear family and that the ultimate goal of being a woman is to achieve motherhood and take care of a family and the ultimate goal of a man is to you know, achieve status or have great um, sexual success, that these maybe basest human motivations are exalted you know, among evolutionary psychologists. And I make the precisely opposite case that, that we have to understand our basest motivations in order to transcend them. And there are some, I think that the motivation for, for status often has very good outcomes. Uh, So I think that a lot of people have, have, have chased status and ended up, you know, helping the world a lot in, in the process. And I think that you can engineer cultural groups or, or in, in a way that increases the status payoff of doing something. So I I know that among kind of effective altruists, donating a ton of your money is is a high status thing to do. 
and uh, dating a model or having a Corvette or having a big house or anything like that would, would not, I mean, I don't think they've managed to reverse it completely, but would not be considered high status. And so, yeah, as an evolutionary psychologist, I think that we have to know where we are in order to transcend where we are. And I think too many people are interested in, in skipping that over. So instead of thinking, um, you know, I, I, I couldn't remember the little, little finger quote from uh, Game of Thrones where he's like, I play a little game and I try and think of the worst motivation someone might have for doing a thing. Uh, I think that generally, if you think about the most self-serving worst motivation for doing any particular thing, you'll identify at least something about what you want in that. And if you, if you just say that humans have these better instincts all the time, then, then you're gonna really uh, miss out. And that's, that's why so much of social engineering hasn't really worked. And there's so much that is in social engineering. You know, just think about this. I, uh, my, one of my favorite examples of this is um, thinking about uh, A Clockwork Orange, uh, about how much people really end up loving um, Alex. What's his name? Is his name Alex, right? <laughs> it's been the so horrible, long. <laughs> the horrible, horrible homicidal mania. I love that yeah. movie. Uh, but and I like the book as well. But how much you end up uh, loving him. But it is true that you could make somebody good uh, actually implementing a protocol like that. Um, Skinner never endorsed anything like that. But if you if you know that that's how somebody is, then then you could overcome it. Uh, and yet we think that if somebody digs in deep down, that they're going to be able to overcome um, these things. It's, you know, it's the problem you've talked about with many of your guests uh, about, the, the, I think the belief in free will really derails our ability to do any deep um, social engineering. And it also makes us more averse to things like genetic engineering or embryo selection, which could make us much, much better because everyone's holding out hope that people will choose better choices. And there's, I mean, the reason this podcast is named the feedback loop is because of that relationship really, right? Is as we change the environment with these technologies, um, we're very much a victim to how that environment influences our genes and, and our behavior. So have you seen ways in which like our modern technology is concerning you in terms of how it's affecting our behavior? Yeah, I think of course we have this problem with uh, technology that it's incredibly addicting. Uh, social media is very addicting. I have this uh, relationship with with Twitter. Actually, it's funny. My father only got on Facebook when he was like sixty five, and he, unbeknownst to him, had the same relationship with it as me. Like he was on there all the time. He was telling me about these Facebook interactions he was having every time I was on the phone with him. He was telling me about like trolling somebody. <laughs> And like very similar to my interactions on, and then he's like a oh, quick cold turkey, like spent a week off and then got back on. And that's precisely my interactions on, on Twitter is this, this uh, push and pull. Uh, so yeah, I think that people are spending a ton of time on social media and each shopping and, and, and pursuing various different status objects. And I don't know why for me, who's, who's trying to get work done and trying to write and engaging in these kinds of productivity hacks. I don't know why there's not a Skinner box for me. Yeah. Why isn't there, why hasn't somebody developed some way of, you know, it, some people would say, oh, this is kind of a capitalist dream to, to try to squeeze every ounce of productivity out of you. But honestly, when you're being really productive, you don't feel less happy than if you're lying around watching YouTube all day. You know, in many ways you feel, you feel better. It's, it's kind of just depends on where you're at. So yeah, I do think that what's happening technologically is, um, is, is difficult. And also, you know, I have this guilty pleasure of watching shows about people with various addictions, addictions to drugs, uh, addictions to food, uh, you know, various different problems. Uh, and I think the, the base reason why everyone watches those shows is to feel better about their life and their life choices. I think <laughs> there's a very much... Uh, yeah, a, a cynical reason behind all that stuff. Some solidarity um, in the suffering. <laughs> well, yeah, you're like, oh, you know, I, I don't have this particular problem. I'm not like addicted to heroin or buying shoes or whatever the case may be. I have a good addiction compared to that bad addiction. <laughs> yeah, exactly. 
Can you uh, can you explain the the Skinner box concept and and maybe something I heard you talk about before is like you want to create a Skinner box for yourself. Could could you expand on that? Sure. So uh, BF Skinner is not really talked about enough, and I think the perception in the general population about psychology is that Freud is still celebrated and Skinner's been debunked, but. Skinnerian thinking is is really important. And unfortunately, I don't think people consider it enough. So Skinner, actually, because he was trying to get by without doing as much work himself, developed a system where it would reinforce pigeons uh, for doing some behavior, either like lever pressing or pecking at a certain object, and they would get a pellet. And he actually ran out of pigeon food at one point. And so that was one of the ways that these schedules, different schedules of reinforcement happened. So he was either feeding them every time they did the requested behavior, or he was giving them more intermittent reinforcement. And so he came up with all these different schedules and they were able to train animals to do all kinds of things. Uh, and there's been a bunch of people who followed in Skinner's footsteps and to some extent, uh, this woman called Karen Pryor who wrote Don't Shoot the Dog, which I highly recommend, uh, also learned how to train animals and not just train animals. Uh, she got dolphins to invent their own uh, tricks. Um, there's an amazing uh, YouTube channel of this woman called Alana Bram, who's, who's trained a fish how to do various different tricks, including a creativity game where every time the fish does something new with a rubber band, he gets rewarded. Wow. So just, you know, it, you don't actually know what you can get out of any organism cognitively, creatively, until you figure out the right schedule of reinforcement. And there's so much kind of untapped potential. So that's my basic idea. And, and Skinner had really, you know, very lofty designs about society. He wrote a book called Walden Two, which was really interesting about how this technology of behavior that he's come up with. Um, and in uh, Beyond Freedom and Dignity, the first chapter is called A Technology of Behavior, where he talks about how we can send a man to the moon, but we can't get people to reliably use contraception mm. or not annihilate each other with nuclear <laughs> weapons or finish high school. You know, there's, there's what might, would seem like a simpler problem than sending people to Mars um, that have not yet been uh, achieved, uh, I think that those problems haven't been solved because of our aversion to the methods of control. Mm. There's definitely things that could that that everybody could do. There's there's untapped potential, uh, and what we see right now in society is people who are incredibly accomplished, but those are the people who have the combination of genius and determination and they're very good at managing themselves or they're very good at figuring out what their weaknesses are whereas there's tons of people who are like lying around on their couches all day who have the same cognitive potential there's just no technology for extracting it and and perhaps the environment too right like if you're in a one, one of the issues i try to focus on there's a book that i'm I've been writing for the last several years kind of exploring some of these similar topics and the thing that I'm trying to really look at is what are the environmental factors such as like stress or maybe cultural narratives that they've bought into, which maybe represent the values of a, of a status hierarchy that they've kind of acquiesced to. Like what, what are those environmental factors doing to their motivation? Is it causing them to sleep less? Is it causing them to think that they need to work 10 hours a day? Is it forcing them to be so cognitively overloaded that they don't have time to think about how to fix dinner and instead get fast food and therefore get a food coma. And like, there's this really vicious cycle that seems to happen um, in these unhealthy environments that inhibit all of that potential. And that's one of the things that I'm most excited about is like, there would be so much genius. I feel like if we could clear off that like stress and those burdens that are really keeping people from thinking to themselves, like when they wake up, what do I want to do today? Like, what makes me curious? What would make me passionate and feel alive? And how can I lean into that? It's so rarely explored, I feel like. Yeah, I think about the conversation that I've heard about universal basic income recently a lot. And Russ Roberts, who I don't know if you've ever uh, listened to Econ Talk, he's, he's just great. Um, but his own personal opinion is really the foundation of it is very much like a work ethic. 
that's yeah, sort of from the baby boomer generation, but that there's that there's dignity in work and that there's dignity in uh, getting up this kind of status hierarchy that we see in academia and in businesses. And if there were not these outlets available to people, um, that they would be living sort of undignified lives. And I do think that we could engineer a society where people don't have to work, but where they don't spend all day uh, m masturbating, eating French fries and playing VR video games, right? Um, what we see now is, is those things. And I think it's in part because we are giving people more freedom than not, not necessarily more freedom, but people are not limiting their own freedom. There's, there's, there's not enough ways that, that we can uh, pay people in, in our capitalist society. Like I have an app called Freedom. It like keeps me off the internet. Um, I have uh, so, like an accountability coach that I email every day. For some reason, her approval matters to me. And uh, she actually, my, the, my accountability coach, her name's uh, Pamela Hobart. And she's got this great blog, which is called um, Stupid Solutions for Stupid Problems. So it might be a stupid problem that you have that you eat French fries late at night or that you're watching YouTube all day or that you um, are drinking alcohol more than you should. Um, her stupid problem is that she's got three kids and uh, they keep her from being able to load the dishwasher. They're like always in the dishwasher. So she got a tiny dishwasher to put on top of her large dishwasher because the kids can't reach it. And she's like, this is a really, really dumb problem. <laughs> to yeah. have, right? I can't keep my kids out of the dishwasher. It doesn't sound like a safe place for children. And she's like, there's tons of dumb problems. I'm not reading with all the books that I want to read. But this kind of gets back to the, the original theme, which is that if you don't know where you're at, uh, if you're not willing to admit to, to people, you know, or, or to yourself uh, where you're at and what your motivations are, then you can't transcend those motivations. Turning your turning your social network into a, uh, a bunch of Skinner boxes. Well, I try. Yeah. I just like, like, uh, yeah, my, my, uh, my husband is like actually not that interested in, in managing me. I've tried many times to be like, here's what I want to get done today. And he's, uh, he's totally uninterested in following up on that. It's not that he actually, you know, if I ask him about it, but revealed preferences show he's not interested. He never does follow up, but he's very encouraging, uh, with it anyway. But I, it's, it surprises me even that in factory work, I know that in factory work, people have um, this kind of reinforcement schedule uh, that they use. Um, and there's been, you know, Skinner and, and other people uh, who were in industrial organizational psychology uh, talked about the developments uh, with that. But there's things that could be even improved upon now. And I can't help but think that we're reluctant to, to do more uh, because it's, it's somehow repugnant to, to manage people's behavior even more than, than we already are. And I'm not really talking about like micromanagement. I'm talking about things that would be more effective than something annoying like that. Yeah, there's the weird kind of realization I've come to find like working on science fiction books or things like that, where it's like the more limitations I have, the more creativity I tend to find. <laughs> That's right. And it's it's remarkable just because you, you lose all of that overwhelming data and you start to come up with these really, you know, uh, you kind of find epiphanies or more like lateral thinking because you just have very few points to connect. And then you're like, wow, this is way easier when I'm not as free. When I have more structure. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Have you looked at all at um, stuff by uh, Mihai Csikszentmihalyi, the flow? Yeah, I, I have looked at a little, I mean, I've read a couple of chapters of his book when I taught undergraduates. That was the flow chapter was one of the, um, the assigned chapters. He's very good at, at, at actually, it was really sad when I was teaching undergraduates because uh, one of the, so in the first year, I, I organized these seminars and I found out that many of these students had never written anything other than like an essay for an exam. They had never just, you know, written um, anything of their own. They'd never journaled or anything like that. So I asked uh, students to, I described what a flow state was. And then I told them to write about what it was like to be in a flow state. And one of them wrote all this thing, this whole thing about like roller skating. And I was like, oh, this is fascinating. It's like, I've never roller skated. I just made this up because I've never experienced a flow state. And I was so sad. <laughs> I mean, like, 
certainly between video games, sex, and eating, <laughs> you, like you definitely experience the flow state. I find it very difficult to believe. Um, but yes, I have I have read uh, some of his stuff. Yeah, I just wondering about the ways that that could be incorporated maybe in because when you mentioned the factory for instance i believe that's one of the things that he references in the book is talking about how a factory worker is able to uh, inject meaning uh, into the repetitive experience by yeah. creating some kind of autonomous uh, aspect to it like playing a game trying to beat their own high score of like how fast they can do something um, trying to see if they can you know just little tiny tricks they they give themselves um, and i'm just wondering about ways that we can, I guess, life hack or, or implement those little behaviors into our life to kind of increase efficiency, increase happiness, decrease stress. Uh, you know, it's funny because yeah. there's a balance between like the goal in some ways is to like get more free so that you can choose less freedom. It seems. Does <laughs> yeah, that make sense? yeah, that does make sense. I agree. Um, yeah. I think that with, with flow states, flow states are just so incredible. Uh, and of course, we can't always, a lot of work is just hard and, and every minute seems like an hour. Uh, but I know that when you're playing a game, that's the whole thing you know, that me, uh, Chicks and Mihai was talking about was how in a, in a flow state, you know that you can accomplish the goal. Like when you're doing a video game, you know that the level that you're trying to beat is not impossible. Right. You know, whereas when you're doing your work, or when you're writing a book or whatever, you know, it might just be impossible to convey the idea that you're trying to convey. You don't know. Yeah. It I heard the, be... the optimal challenge is 4% beyond your skills, I believe, which is like, how do you know how to conceptualize that when you're working on something? That's another thing is that I've seen people try and do is, is to gamify. Uh, you know, certainly I find gamification incredibly reinforcing when it comes to exercise. Um, I joined Peloton during the pandemic, like everyone else, which is why Peloton's worth like trillions of dollars. Now. <laughs> and uh, I don't have a Peloton bike or anything, but I have just the app. And there's these really charismatic people. And I like, I work for badges that no one will ever see. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like I'm really, really strongly reinforced by these, these badges. Don't. That's that feedback that we want. Are there other ways that you uh, kind of life hack or do trick yourself, like using evolutionary tricks, the things that you know your body, your brain are going to respond to? Do you find ways to protect yourself from your weaknesses or uh, empower your strengths? There's, there's like a whole lot of hacks that I have for myself these days, um, other than, uh, you know, not, not engaging in stuff that's going to upset me or, or make me feel uh, envious. I don't, I don't participate in, in Instagram or, or anything like that, uh, because I think that those things would ultimately just make me feel uh, worse about myself. But I do think that when it comes to this view that I have about human psychology, this view that I have that in the right context and in the right, the right learning context with the right punishments and reinforcements, um, people's behavior could be much better, but people don't have free will. They might have conscious will, but they don't, they don't have free will. And I think Sam Harris and, and um, Annika Harris and, and other people have talked about this. It does make you much more forgiving of other people. Mm -hmm. yeah. Absolutely. And I think that's one of the things to, to our earlier topic with social media that concerns me, especially from an evolutionary psychology perspective is if we're constantly on the lookout for um, status identifiers or for acceptance and belonging, or we're looking to understand what behaviors we should do or not do. A lot of it seems to be filtered through likes and follows and comments and stuff on social media, but that seems like a very shallow uh, version of, I guess, norms and values. Like if you post a picture of yourself that's very sexy there's a natural like response for instance for people to like that more than if you post something that's like less sexy do you, you know what i'm saying there's there's these weird signifiers and then if you're somebody who's responding to that all the time then you start to only really think about yourself maybe as a physical sexual entity rather than you know somebody with intelligence and other yeah. traits and i worry about the way that we're using social media in that way to, to kind of tell us who we are there's this quantification of status which is yeah like likes and retweets and stuff and uh there's a certain withdrawal that i experience when i get off social media where you're like oh you know i'm not getting i'm not getting this kind of feedback anymore 
but it's also very far removed from what it's like to get approval and love and attention from people in real life. And one thing that I've noticed uh, with this pandemic is I was going, I, I'll go out and go for a walk. And it's always awkward to like walk by somebody in a hallway or like on a sidewalk, especially I'm in the South. So people say hello. It's not like New York where like there's no expectation that someone will say hello to you. And it's just even more awkward. Like the timing of when you say hello, I feel, and I don't know if it was because I was sick or if it's because I haven't seen people in groups in a long time, but it just seems so, so much stranger uh, to be around other people. And I do think that there's been an acceleration of status gain through social media uh, during this, this lockdown. That's a kind of a tangent here, but that makes me think of your work with effective altruism. And a lot of the listeners to this podcast, for instance, are working with Singularity University and are focused on, you know, kind of our tagline, which is impacting a billion people. And one thing I was thinking about when I was preparing to talk for you is like, why do we have so many people who want to help a billion strangers when there's no evolutionary advantage, really? Like there's, they're not kin, they're not going to help pass on our genetics. Um, Maybe there's a status thing involved here. Um, But I'm wondering what your thoughts are on that and just effective altruism in general. You know, Peter Singer talked about the expanding the moral circle and Steven Pinker has also talked about expanding the moral circle in a different way about how things like literature made us able to potentially and the the greater literacy rate potentially made people more able to step into the shoes of of people they didn't know or, or to identify with people that they didn't know. I think effective altruism is a fairly small movement for a reason, and that's because it is difficult to leverage these sentiments towards strangers. And I remember back in, I think it was 2014, I went to an effective altruism conference in California. And at that time, people were talking a lot about future people, like Eliezer Yudkowsky was talking about how if you could increase by 1% the chance that we would colonize the galaxy or prevent a rogue artificial intelligence from destroying humanity or nanobots from making everything into gray group, you know, pick your science fiction um, demise. That if we could do that and there were, you know, billions and billions of people or trillions and trillions of people in the future and they were living good lives, that those future people would, would matter more than anyone currently. And I was incredibly skeptical of this idea and uh, of the idea that we should morally prioritize uh, future people. Uh, My intuitions were very much against the idea that we should prioritize future people over current people, uh, especially people in the developing world. And we did this exercise. I don't know if it's called circling. I think it might be something like that. So we were in groups and they said, okay, make eye contact with somebody. The first person you make eye contact with, uh, imagine that this is somebody that you know and love in person. So make eye contact with a person. It was awkward, it was fine. You imagining that you love a stranger, it's okay. And then you rotate and you're like, this is this next person is the person I'm living on the other side of the world. And they have the same interest that you do in living a fulfilling life with very little suffering and make eye contact with that person and then circle again and now make eye contact with somebody. This is a future person and this future person wants to live and they have the same goals and wishes and hopes and dreams and suffering and pain uh, that you do. And that one exercise in about two minutes changed my intuitions about future people. So that experience really made me realize how much I was at the mercy of my evolved intuitions and not caring about future people. Maybe your listeners are familiar with an idea called scope insensitivity. You know, we, we care a lot about Nemo, the fish, but we don't really care about the trillion of fish, you know, that, that people like pull up from the sea every year. It might be a trillion. And we care a lot about one little girl 
uh, who's who's uh, malnourished in, in Central America, but we don't care about a thousand other little girls uh, like her as much. You, you can't care a thousand times more. Right. And uh, for so many people, the idea of this this like huge amount of suffering is it just boggles their minds. Um, there's a, I think it's a Michelin web sketch. There's this very funny comedy sketch uh, where this guy has like, he gets like a $3 million endowment. And he says, uh, you know, if I gave it to Africa, that would be like a drop in the bucket. If I gave it to like vaccine research, instead, uh, what I'm going to do is save all the donkeys in the UK. I'm going to have a donkey trust. And I know that $3 million can really literally solve the problem of all of the unwanted and maltreated donkeys in the UK. And I think that, that there's a certain, uh, you know, evolved intuitive satisfaction with something like that. Like, why would I do something that's a drop in the bucket mm. when I, you know, it just, it just seems kind of pointless. It doesn't, it doesn't leverage any of our motivations. There's not like a real sense of reward if you're doing something that doesn't show a, like a real tangible impact. Or, or an impact on, on anybody who cares, either a status impact or a sexual impact or a kin impact. Those things are, uh, are the things that, that need to be leveraged. Um, I wrote, I, I didn't, write a full science fiction short story, but I wrote a science fiction short story um, a few years back, which involved uh, people being chemically altered so that they would attach to adopted children the way that they would attach to their own uh, biological children. And there were these really strange experiments done like in the 1960s, uh, where they took a baby away from a mother right after he or she was born for three hours, or they gave the baby directly to the mother within half an hour of the baby being born. And those studies claimed that they could see differences in how mothers treated their children forever after that, um, depending on whether they were separated for a long time. So there is this like critical period of, of bonding. And I have so much admiration for people who adopt because there's just so many evolutionary obstacles to that. And I would love it if there were some way to, you know, there's a lot of people who talk about moral enhancement and that's a kind of moral enhancement uh, that on the one hand, people celebrate parents who adopt, uh, but on the other hand, I don't think very many people would sign up for a procedure that would make them neurologically as attached to un, unrelated children as they are to their own children. Yeah. Is that a, is that a future you're excited about? Cause I, I know you mentioned earlier, like what we could do with uh, manipulating the genome and, and, and oh, yeah. potentially changing our genetics. Um, do you embrace that as a, as a future technology? Are you excited to see things like CRISPR and genetic uh, manipulation become mainstream? Yes, I am. I mean, I, but I was much more excited I have to say that this whole experience that I've had with, with the pandemic, I had much more confidence in science and society and social engineering before this pandemic than I do now. And before this pandemic, I thought that there were a lot of things just kind of over the horizon. Uh, things like you know, people selecting smart embryos or gene uh, selection, various things like that. And uh, I've just seen people behave so irrationally. Um, and I've seen such a huge just fall from grace, even when it comes to Europe and, and the, the failure of lockdowns, the failure of people to make trade-offs uh, between um, freedom and, and lives. And, and so many people just disgusted by the idea that we would trade off uh, the life and quality of life of some millions of people over the uh, quality of life or, or lives at all of maybe some older people. It just, it just, and also just seeing so many epidemiologists just saying nonsense <laughs> for the last year. Um, so I have to say that like pre-pandemic, I would have just been so delighted to talk to you about transhumanism and about all of the ways that I think we're gonna improve ourselves. 
uh, over the next several uh, decades and about you know cryonics and, and all this stuff. And I know people who have told me, you know, all my all the time that I've been interested in this stuff, uh, this is like so, so out there. There's no really use like thinking about this stuff. And somehow, not somehow, I mean, it is a very, very clear causal direction <laughs> between how I've seen humans deal with this pandemic and my faith uh, in future technology as it relates to longevity and, and health. Do you think there's a particular impetus or source of that? Like one thing I wonder about, especially with your specialty and disgust, is if knowing that there is a germ or a virus uh, out in the environment that we could easily get, if that's making us very conservative or very risk averse in ways that are, or, or stressed or anxious in ways that are making us just make lots of bad decisions. Like, do you see a, a core thread weaving all of this? Uh... I mean, it could be, yeah, it could just be like, I had COVID and now I'm like an old conservative lady. And <laughs> you know, I-, I You've changed, be, Diana. I've changed. I'm like different than I ever used to be. I'm, I'm like, just, yeah, gonna start baking or whatever. Um, <laughs> I think, uh, no, it's just, it's just like the complete uh, inability of people to make uh, trade-offs and like, even, you know, I'll just give you one example, even somebody who I think is pretty smart, Carl Zimmer, who I think writes for the New York times, he was uh, endorsing this idea that black lives matter protests. There was this sort of paper that people wrote uh, that black lives matter protests reduced the prevalence of COVID, like I think in Arizona. <laughs> and the, 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 the explanation I read in the paper was basically um, uh, white people, mostly white people, were less likely to leave their homes because they were afraid of the protests. And so because BLM protests were scary, people stayed home. <laughs> Which is really good. <laughs> like had like a good, had a good. I mean, that actually all may be true, but um, the, the data didn't really, it didn't really support it. Uh, and also, uh, when it came to uh, came to lockdown, yeah. I mean, even even this 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 time last year, or was it this time uh, two years ago? Um, this a Chinese doctor who uh, did CRISPR on two baby girls to make them HIV resistant. The response to that was just unbelievable. And, um, and Steve Su uh, also, he didn't get fired, but he got taken off of uh, a research position because he, you know, he quote unquote endorsed eugenics. So uh, I don't think that Right now, it seems like the the prevalence morality uh, right now in, in society seems to be more concerned with uh, fairness um, than it is concerned with potentially a, a rising tide lifts all boats uh, with with progress. You were mentioning there um, about, I guess, the the way the cultural narratives are changing things and. I don't know if this is in your scope or not, but one thing I've been really fascinated with is how language can, I guess, hijack our evolutionary behavior. Mm -hmm. what, what is the, this is going to be pretty open into question, but like in your mind, what do you see the impact of language on evolution? How have we ad adapted to respond to language? Is it very much just like language represents our value systems? And so we just kind of acquiesce to whatever that uh, value system is. Uh, yeah, my thoughts on this are super scattered. So I'll make, I'll, make, I'll make like three points. One point is that I do think that people are getting, because of uh, things like Twitter and texting and emojis and things like that, uh, people are getting less and less good at having a diverse um, and rich vocabulary. Um, you see all kinds of like there's there's so many words like vibe, which has now replaced everything from like context to demeanor. <laughs> like there's no there, there are all these words that are being replaced um, by fewer words. Uh, so I do think that that's uh, one problem is this like poverty of, of language that we're seeing uh, more and more uh, now. And so there's the, also this kind of double speak where people are talking about um, equity. Uh, so especially like when you look at like sort of social justice 
activist uh, narratives about equity, inclusion, and, and diversity, uh, those words mean different things than I think the average person uh, would think that they would mean. And there's been this push and pull about diversity. So people like Heterodox Academy say, you know, uh, you really should prioritize diversity of viewpoint. Whereas other people are saying, you know, if you have an ethnic diversity, uh, then you'll also see uh, uh, diverse viewpoints, although they don't explain actually how that would work uh, very well. Uh, so uh, there, there does seem to be some some stuff like that going on, and so uh, yeah, I don't know if any of this uh, is is relevant, but that's those are my uh, completely unguided thoughts about that. Oh, no worries. <laughs> that that touches on as much as I could have asked for. Um, I don't want to take too much more of your time here, but I thought maybe we could just end with tossing the uh, ball in your court a little bit. And is there anything that you're particularly interested in exploring these days? Maybe something you'd like to share that you're working on or something you're excited about? Anything at all? Yeah, I'm going to be, I'm still working on this book, which is about manipulation and close interpersonal relationships. And I've been working on that uh, for some time. And I think that when we are more aware of how we're trying to change one another's behavior uh, and we're more aware you know from an evolutionary perspective what our motivations are it, it can really help us uh, become better but i'm 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 just a, i'm just very much in favor of having a cynical view of oneself um, as a way to transcend one's one's basis motivations um, but moreover lately i've been researching how illness can can change people's personalities and so that's something that I'm uh, I'm looking into and I'm going to be uh, blogging about soon is just you know from my personal experience uh, some changes in my personality since I had COVID I don't think they're going to last forever uh, but now that you've had you know millions of people who've had this uh, disease uh, what is what is the evidence behind that there's this emotion that people rarely talk about it's called lassitude there's a whole paper written about it in 2020 and lassitude is this risk aversion, social anxiety, introversion, uh, maybe people who are yeah, not as open to experience as they were before, uh, but also trying to think about how this uh, pandemic has influenced so much that we've seen in the past year. Uh, I've been thinking about that a lot. And there's this area of research about how when people feel that their lives are threatened, they're more likely to also engage in risky behavior. So um, that's, that's yeah, what I've been thinking about lately and, and I should be writing something up about that soon. And where can people go to find these things that you are writing? I am uh, at sentientist, S-E-N-T-I-E-N-T-I-S-T -E -E uh, on Twitter. Uh, I have a blog that needs some love. Uh, it's called dianaverse.com or yeah. Uh, and then I also uh, write, have a blog at psychology today, but if you go to dianafleischman.com, you'll see all my links there. Wonderful. We'll include that in the show notes and everything to make it easy for everybody. Yep. Awesome. Well, Diana, I want to thank you very much for your time, especially uh, the first <laughs> interview back post COVID. Uh, yeah. Hope it wasn't too hard for you. No, I, I, I feel like I, I, I mostly made sense. So that was good. <laughs> you did. You did. I understood all the words you said. <laughs> all the words. <laughs> yeah. So we're good. We're good. <laughs>